the first thing I did is I lived the life of what an Indian e-commerce seller lives when they want to sell overseas. I think today you can effectively deliver a product from India to most countries within seven to 10 days. And if you want to pay more, you can even do it in four to five days. So it's really interesting, right? You're finding these different niches of products where brands really can succeed. We have this team of people between us and our partners who will do everything end to end. Tell us what price you want your product to sell at, what is the net return you want out of it. We'll work with you on a pilot for three months and we'll tell you whether you're going to be able to achieve your objective or not. He said, you know what, I'm shocked in the pilot that every design I think I'm very proud of making and that people will love it is not selling. And every design that I think, you know, I'm doing this, uh, but I don't think it'll really sell is, is a hit. What's happening here? Why am I not being able to understand it? Hello and welcome to the Indian Dream Podcast. I'm your host Siddharth and today I'm going to start the episode with a question for you. Can you think of any Indian consumer brand who has been able to build a global presence for themselves? I'm not talking about B2B companies like Infosys, TCS, Wipro. We all know they've built large global brands. But when it comes to Indian consumer brands, there are very few examples. When I was initially thinking about it, only Royal Enfield and Old Monk were the two brands that came to my mind who have somewhat global presence, but not truly. And then it struck me. Bollywood is the only consumer brand that has been built sitting out of India for the entire globe. But the point remains, when it comes to physical products, when it comes to consumer brands, there are very, very few examples. And that got me thinking, why is that? And what can we do to change it? Those are the exact question that Akshay Gulati, founder of ShipRocket, helped us answer in this episode. ShipRocket is popularly known for the logistic solutions that it provides to D2C brands. However, ShipRocket X, an initiative within the house of ShipRocket, was started by Akshay to help Indian consumer brands go global. They provide end-to-end -end support, right from figuring out global distribution channels, branding, marketing, demand generation, compliance, logistics, all of it. So naturally, he has a lot of interesting insights about all these topics. And on the episode, he talks about live case studies about brands that have seen global traction over the last couple of years. What's interesting about Akshay is in order to research this problem statement, he actually started his own brand and took it global to learn from it so that he could then apply all these learnings to the brands that he's working with. So if you're a consumer brand in India with the ambition of going global, you're going to love this episode. And if you do like the episode, don't forget to hit subscribe. Without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Akshay, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, especially because it's going to be about a topic that I'm personally very curious about, which is taking Indian brands global. Um, it feels like the right time. Everybody keeps talking about it. But if you look at the past, there are very few consumer brands that have really gone global. There are, you know, B2B brands like TCS, Infosys that, are, that have uh, a global presence. But when you talk about consumer brands, we have some regional brands, some in Africa, some in Europe, but truly global brand from India, very few. Why do you think this is the right time? And what your, what's your experience been in the recent past? So again, Sid, thank you for having me here today. Um, I think it's absolutely the right time for Indian brands to go global. And while this has been a passion area for me for a long time, I could not have made this statement three years ago because I still think it was not the right time then. I remember, you know, as a kid, when we used to travel abroad, it was a sense of pride when you saw an Indian product. And most often that Indian product was on four wheels, a Tata truck or a Suzuki car. It was way back in the day when we thought that Suzuki was an Indian brand. And as you grow up, you realize, no, Maruti, Suzuki is an Indian brand. Suzuki is a Japanese company. But outside of, you know, those uh, few examples, which are few and far between, you didn't really see a lot of Indian products on, especially not consumer products on shelves, whether it was in Europe or the US. And I think this started to change about five to six years ago when Make in India was getting a big push, right? I think that entire concept of Indian products standing for quality, for standing for uh, a concept, for example, Ayurveda as a concept, you know, Indian products are considered to be the best in that field. Uh, I think that is when things started changing because you started seeing great products, not just great products. We probably always had that, but great products in great packaging, which is a very big thing for Indian brands to be able to attract, let's say, an international consumer because those are the kind of products that you're competing with. And I think that trend started to change five to six years ago. Make in India was a big push. We had this whole D2C revolution in India and Indian consumers themselves today have, are very discerning, right? You have choices, multiple choices for almost any product you want to buy. So to be able to get share of wallet of an Indian consumer is also very challenging. And a lot of brands have now innovated and some of them have even created product categories, right? There are shampoo brands which are catering to a certain type of hair. And while, you know, that category might have a limit in India after a certain point of time, the moment you can sell that product globally, your market is infinite almost, right? And I think the way these brands have been set up is to be global brands. 
I think the first part is this, the quality of the product probably was always there, but the packaging has really improved or the marketing that Indian entrepreneurs are taking, uh, are making today. And uh, outside of the FMCG brands, which are anyways global, I think Indian entrepreneurs today can give them a run for their money. I think that's one big thing that's changed. And the other big thing I think that's changed is supply chain. Generally, I think post pandemic, the supply chain has become far more efficient globally, not just for B2B movement of goods. We're not talking about rice and steel moving between countries, but even that e-commerce parcel, which is 50 to 100 grams going from India to anywhere in the world, it's become a lot easier. So one of the big bottlenecks for Indian brands used to be, we need to store goods overseas for to be able to be to be able to deliver them in four to five days, for example. Because example, for a personal care brand or even maybe for fashion, no one's going to wait 15 to 20 days for, their, for the product to be delivered. I think today you can effectively deliver a product from India to most countries within seven to 10 days. And that's a reason. And if you want to pay more, you can even do it in four to five days for Express. You know, I think that's something that's changed and it's lowered the barrier to entry. Indian brands don't necessarily have to export goods, store them in the destination country and then uh, sell them because getting goods back to India still continues to be a huge problem, which needs to be fixed because products that are returned, products that are unsold pretty much have to be destroyed or liquidated. And again, that's a barrier to entry for many brands which want to sell globally. So I think lots change. And last but not the least, I think the government's making a huge push for Indian exports. I think there are uh, the vision is to have the Indian B2C export economy rival China at some point in time. And for that, the infrastructure is now being set up. So I think the building blocks are there. Uh, it'll be yeah. very interesting to see how this, uh, how the final picture unfolds. Yeah, and still a long way ahead, right? Um, I mean, as you said, the last few years have laid the foundation, but there's so much more potential on what's what what can happen. Um, most when people think about exports, you mentioned rice, you know, steel. Uh, these are very low value added stuff. So we we either grow them, we either manufacture them, but at a very low value addition, we sort of export them, right? So the actual benefit the actual margins where you can actually brand a product and and take it to market uh, that's not really happened in india it's very exciting to see that over the last few years some brands have been able to go um, i know we have a lot to discuss in in different parts but one of the most interesting things for me when we were talking about this before was you've been running pilots with certain brands helping them go global um, you know, in all aspects, you know, be it listing on on some of the marketplaces, helping them enter the market. When we think about Ship Rocket in general, it it's more shipping. But it was very exciting for me to know that you've lived that entire journey, run a pilot of taking an Indian brand global. Can you take us through what that experience was like, and you know, whatever you can tell tell us about the brand as well? No, absolutely. And uh, I'll let, and I'll I'll take you through a couple of experiences because honestly, before we started Ship Rocket X. The first thing I did is I lived the life of what an Indian e-commerce seller lives when they want to sell overseas. So I created a brand called Miraki. I built a website. I listed it on Shopify. I listed it on Amazon, eBay, Etsy, you know, the whole hog. We listed the brand. We, you know, kind of sourced nice products, handmade products. It was hand-painted doorknobs or, you know, hand-knotted carpets, exported it to the U.S., you know, stored it with Amazon FBA. So basically for six months, lived the life of what an Indian entrepreneur lives when they want to sell online because the first you know usually the first point of contact that you have with selling overseas is selling on a marketplace it's actually the easiest and even today it's, it tends to be the easiest first you do that then as your business grows you say you know i want to have my own dot com website and then you build on shopify magento woocommerce any platform you want and then the last you know the holy grail for most indian d2c brands is to go offline and that tends to be the holy grail in India as well, right? Everyone sees it as a huge market and it's true because a large portion of the sales happen offline. So I didn't do the, I didn't do the last one uh, when, I, when I was running my own brand there for six months. I did the first two. And, you know, we identified the whole idea to do this was to identify the pain points that a seller faces when they're kind of trying to take their brand global. And I think listing is a huge challenge, like you rightly pointed out. And it's and today probably less so than about three and a half years ago when I, just before COVID, I think in 2018, 19, we did this pilot. At that point, you know, it was very hard to, you know, get what Amazon calls, for example, A plus content in terms of the keywords and the way you build a listing. Not many people in India were aware of that. The product shoot has to happen in a certain way. I think in the last four years, that is a challenge that has been overcome to a large extent. A lot of agencies are out there to help you uh, do that. I think uh, the second biggest thing is logistics, right? Because there's so much paperwork that you need to do when you want to send 
a shipment overseas if it's not a B2C shipment. A B2C shipment is fairly easy, but there were terms like CSB4, which is a gift or a sample, CSB5, which is a commercial shipment. When people were asking me these questions from the carriers, my they just literally were going like this. I was like, what are you talking about? So I think the first journey that we lived was of being a seller and we had moderate success, I would say. Some of our products sold really well, some of our products didn't sell at all. My most expensive SKU was a $5,000 carpet that I had sent and I had no way to bring it back to India. It was it was really sad. It was one piece, never got sold, you know, and that's, that's another pain point I realized is that eventually I had to liquidate it at like 20% of the cost, right? And it, because I was not physically there, the pandemic happened. Otherwise, I'd have tried to recover my money. Uh, since uh, it was my money that was being invested. But, uh, um, you know, we lived through that challenge and we realized that returns, liquidation, these tend to be big issues. And that's how we kind of started thinking about ShipRocket X. The first thing we did in ShipRocket X was obviously build our dropship model, which is allowing sellers to keep inventory in India and then list on overseas platforms. And as and when an order comes, they ship it directly to the consumer. It's actually the lowest barrier to entry. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a good model, it works. I think the two problems that Indian sellers face today, one is returns, because with this model, you don't have a warehouse or a local address in the US, so you're not able to take returns back. So most sellers are saying no returns, and that reduces the conversion on the website. Or if you do offer returns, you just have to destroy them. And the second issue that people face is that, uh, like like I said, if you, if you have returns, you have to destroy them. Sorry, yeah. So either you take returns and have a local operation in the US, or if you don't take returns, you have to liquidate that, and that affects your conversion. Um, and I think that that is how we started ShipRocket X and the pilots that you were referring to, you know, is, is we've launched a couple of brands on our platform and that that has not just been on Dropship, that's been the entire whole hog, right? Which is starting with Dropship, then once we figure out what's selling, what's not selling, it's important to then take your hero skews, like we call it, the product which is selling very well, we take them, we send them to our warehouse in the US, we have a warehouse in Pennsylvania, we have a warehouse in New York. And then as and when order comes, as and when an order comes, we're able to ship it to the consumer within 48 hours, which is pretty much the experience you'll, give, you'll get if you're buying from a domestic seller, for example, in the US. And right now, uh, this solution for us is only live in the US. We haven't really done it anywhere else. Uh, so what we did is we, we went through, you know, we went through the list of sellers that we have who are working with us domestically and found out categories that we believe are best selling categories on the large marketplaces. And there's a demand for products of Indian origin. So fashion jewelry, for example, amazing category. Lightweight product, very unique to India. Uh, no sizing issues, unlike fashion, right? Uh, and they tend to be low to mid value. Now, I'm not talking about like emeralds or diamonds. I'm talking about costume jewelry, right? And we have a huge um, strength in manufacturing, really nice ethnic jewelry, the way we call it. It's not even silver. Usually it's sterling silver or you know, silver plated jewelry, and it's easy to export this. There's no, there are no customs or duty issues around it. The US tends to be a market that we favor because it has an $800 de minimis value. So anything up to $800, there's no import duty to be paid. So it's fairly easy for an Indian seller to, you know, be able to work there. The second categories that we found out, which were a bit of a surprise to me, this one, if you, if someone told me without me knowing much, I'd say, yeah, makes sense, was, for example, FMCG products like peanut butter huge category in the US, right? I would not think that India has this, you know, competitive advantage in manufacturing peanut butter versus other parts of the world, right? We, at least I, I studied in the US, I lived there for some time, you know, Skippy peanut butter used to be a part of most American household shelves, right? But huge category and Indian D2C brands have been set up in this category and they have a huge advantage in terms of cost. So they're able to sell very, very competitively. And then they also have, you know, for example, organic peanut butter, different flavors of peanut butter. They, I think Indian D2C brands, because you have to work so hard to get a consumer's attention in this category in India, because it's not a mass market category. They've really innovated to the point that the product has a huge demand in the US. And last but not least, pet care. You know, and this is, again, it's a passion area for me because I'm a pet parent. So I kind of gravitated towards this because when I found the answer, I went deeper and deeper into it. But the kind of products that we get in India, for example, with, you know, pet snacks, which are human grade food, you know, um, it's, it's incredible. There are a lot of brands, for example, in the West, which are trying to do something similar, but the price points are usually 10x of what you can get in India. So even after you take into account logistics, listing, marketplace commissions, you're able to make a nice profit and sell really good, healthy pet snacks in the US. 
So, you know, these are the three categories that we found. Well, pet care and fashion accessory are the two brands that we launched in the, uh, in the US. For the peanut butter brand, we're working with a partner and we're doing the supply chain for them. So it's really interesting, right? We're finding these different niches of products where brands really can succeed. And what is really different is like you rightly said, everyone thinks of ShipRocket because we have ship in our name and they think of shipping. And the, but the world for us started there absolutely about six, seven years ago. But today it's a lot more, right? So today we, and it was not just for international and our global business, but even within India, uh, it's very clear that you only get shipments when brands succeed, when they get orders and they have stuff to ship. So we created an ecosystem even in India about five years ago to help brands and sellers succeed in selling online because it's yeah. so convoluted. You know, D2C, for example, you can burn a lot of money and not get a lot of traction in that channel unless you know what you're doing. So we worked with a lot of partners in the ecosystem to be able to create education, to be able to create solutions for Indian brands to successfully sell online in India. <clears throat> and the same thing we're now doing for the US, right? And I say yeah. US because that is our first pilot country. Even though we ship everywhere in the world, a lot of the solutions I'm talking to you about, the warehousing, the returns, the liquidation, all of that we first launched in the US and now we're going to launch before Q4, which is the biggest holiday season in the West in multiple countries. Yeah. We targeted the US biggest market and we are now working to provide a, the same set of solutions with different partners to be even able to go to a brand and you know create a study for them. And we don't charge them for anything. We work with our partners to tell them that you know these are the opportunities we see for you in these markets. We'll even help them identify whether the US, the UK, GCC, Southeast Asia, whatever it is, which are the right markets for them to first go into. And then, of, of course, ShipRocket runs the entire supply chain. And then we have partners who will kind of take care of the other aspects of it, whether it's the Amazon marketing, whether it's Facebook marketing. It's very important because a lot of entrepreneurs who I have met in the last three months that I've been pitching this, they say, we want to go global. We love it. But the first barrier to entry in the head is that this is going to cost a lot of money. My business in India is growing. I have enough to deal with as it is. Why should we do this now? And I think the second biggest barrier to entry is that it's very, very complex, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, if they have an option to say go global or go offline, a lot of brands say I'd rather go offline today. And yeah, I think yeah. it's not a choice and it's a, it's, it's a decision that any uh, company can make. But what we've tried to do is to create a solution which is almost as simple as telling a brand, we think your product can sell internationally. We have this team of people between us and our partners who will do everything end to end. Tell us what price you want your product to sell at. What is the net return you want out of it? We'll work with you on a pilot for three months and we'll tell you whether you're going to be able to achieve your objective or not. And if not, no strings attached. You can decide to do it on your own. You can decide to do it with us uh, or you can decide not to do it at all. And that's nice. what we found gets a lot of traction. Yeah. Uh, I have so much to sort of double click on. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting to hear that in order to build this, the first thing that you did was actually live that life, right? Unless you live that life of taking a brand global and what it actually entails, you don't know the day-to-day -day frustration that a person has to deal with, which as you rightly pointed out, for a founder, there's already so much chaos. There's already so much happening in India. How do you even take out the bandwidth to say, I will go out and figure out exports and global, right? Uh, I have a very small story right before the pandemic or right after the pandemic. I was exploring a bunch of different ideas. I was trying to figure out what I want to do next. Um, and one of the things is I try to sell something to us through Amazon FBA. And for people who are not aware, the minute you log on to Amazon seller central, you have this portal in front of you, which you have no idea what it's supposed to do. It's not, sometimes it's not just plain English where, you know, I'm very familiar with software. I've lived in the software world for all my career. I went in there and I panicked. I'm like, I have no idea how this works. Right. Um, so I can imagine for people who've not really done it, it's very hard. And, uh, because that's not never happened in India, there's not, it's not a ready skill set that's available now in the last two, three, four years, there are agencies that have come up to actually help this, but you know, I can imagine three years ago, there was actually no one who actually knew how to do this. Um, very interesting that you've, you've done this, um, uh, you know, on your own before you actually went, went out and built ship rocket X. What I also want to understand, uh, from you Akshay is. There's obviously a price angle, right? Like when somebody is buying from India, unless it's extremely authentic, only only found in India stuff, price is going to be an angle that we need to fight on, which is we are cheaper to make, um, given you know all the all the unit economics that go in here. But I'm assuming there's more to it, right? There's you you briefly hinted at the fact that the product has to be top notch, right? So it's not just hey, it's going to be 10x cheaper. 
it's going to be 10 times cheaper but at the same quality or better in terms of what your alternatives are but I, so I, just double clicking on that is there a reestablishment of product market fit that you need to do there when you go global cuz what might work in india might not work in the us given their behaviors and and preferences no absolutely and you hit the nail right on the head it it doesn't and so far in the experience that we've had tastes uh, and preferences preferences tend to be very different and i'll tell you i i was speaking to an entrepreneur two weeks ago and we're looking to take their kidswear brand global and he said you know what i'm shocked in the pilot that every design i think i'm very proud of making and that people will love it is not selling and every design that i think you know i'm doing this uh but i don't think it'll really sell is is a hit what's happening here why am i not being able to understand it because that entrepreneur's understanding of the market is very much based on indian sensibilities of selling in india right and as and when that he is now trying to sell in the us it's it's a very very different like sensibility product sensibility stays are very different and i think that's one thing that's very important to understand is that you know product market fit i think product market fit for the brand uh does not need to be established again i think you very quickly find out if people are resonating with the brand but i think product market fit for different products in terms of what your hero skews are going to be what's going to sell is not going to be the same as what necessarily sells in india it could be but that's not a given and i think that's why it's so important to explore you know low low cost models like the dropship model that we have which you know you list on a marketplace for example see where the maximum number and it's not just about orders it's where the maximum number of eyeballs are coming so for example um one very interesting realization for me was that you know when we were working with one of with the fashion accessory brand the highest selling skew was a particular skew that wasn't a big shock for us right it, we knew that this is this is sells in india it's going to sell there it was you know earrings antique silver they call it antique silver it's actually semi precious it's artificial jewelry but the color is antique silver um and you know very indian ethnic you could imagine that a lot of people especially affiliated with the indian diaspora are going to love buying that product but the maximum number of views actually came on a product which was costume jewelry but it was temple jewelry very very indian ethnic temple jewelry right uh, and they were also earrings but uh, got the maximum number of views but the conversion was very very low because every, like, everything about that product was very appealing people clicked on it they liked it and what we realized oh, and it was very easy to write off that product saying that theek hai this doesn't sell but because it was getting so many views clearly people were interested and i think the biggest thing that we realized for example was that the product shoot was not showing at the product shoot was about the earring and it was about a close up of a woman's ear wearing that earring and we just added two products to someone wearing that earring with western outfits right to see how the it would look not on a sari but let's say on a on 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 western wear and adding those two images and both those images were with an indian model so it was not like we used an overseas model increase the conversion like the, it suddenly became the best selling shoe and you know and it's, it's it was just a thought you know looking at it we were trying to figure out what's wrong and that product does did not sell as much in india right but there were a lot of people coming to look at it so clearly they liked what they were seeing and i think that is something that we were able to quickly overcome so it's 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 very you get a lot of signals there's so much data today when you especially when you sell online i think it's right. about looking at that data taking those signals in and not reacting also saying oh this is not selling there's no product market fit i think you have to first figure out why it's not selling and we and then we sim- we did you know we added that shoot for example for every product out there right in that catalog uh, for costume jewelry and i think conversion across the board went up about 20 to 30% interesting very interesting so um, there's method to the madness right like this is cut back to 5 or 6 years ago there's no way you can collect this data right it's almost like go big or go home which is if you're going to export you have to take all your inventory you know part tie up with someone there which was a big risk for most indian entrepreneurs yeah. now that the stakes have lowered significantly where you can actually iterate your way to product market fit and success in a global market um when it comes to demand generation you hinted at the fact that marketplaces are probably the best route to go tell us a little bit about um is it amazon is it you know regional marketplaces in those countries how do you even figure out what countries are you going to take it to depending on the products what's happening in that you know are certain countries and regions coming out to be better for indian products versus versus other regions no absolutely and i'll, I'll answer the second part of that question first right i think um the one thing that's really important for us all to understand is that global while as a term it sounds great 
is it's really not possible to do in one shot. So I think it's very important, like you rightly said, for any entrepreneur to identify which market they want to sell at, sell, sell in. And it has to be one market at a time. It can't be five markets in one shot because honestly, it won't work. You'll end up burning a lot of capital and you'll end up writing off the channel by itself. So what we in the first phase do is we'll work with the entrepreneur to be able to identify which geography is right for them. And that's why we actually work with partners who can list products in multiple countries. So our partner, we have partners who can list in the US, UK, Southeast Asia, GCC, across like, I think it's over 70 different marketplaces. But we'll pick two or three depending on what we think is right for the brand. And we will not, just because we can, we will not list across 70 in, at the outset. Because it's very important with limited capital to get a definitive answer on what the market offers. Because if you, let's say, have $10,000, if you split it across five markets, that's $2,000 a market. You won't get a definitive answer in terms of what's working, what's not working. Better to take that $10,000 invested in one market and figure out what's working, what's not working for that market. So I think that's the first thing. And yes, I am a big proponent of marketplace selling at the outset uh, as, let's say, phase one of global expansion. I think phase two has to be D2C because you need to create brand love beyond uh, just the marketplaces because at the end of the day, it is cluttered. Your product is going to compete with 20,000 other products out there unless it's so unique that, you know, um, it's a category by itself. And I think the third phase is then as this brand succeeds and you have the online love is to try and sell offline. Again, offline is important for certain categories of products, not necessarily for every category of product. So, for example, with our costume jewelry brand, it's not even part of our roadmap right now. We don't, it's not the next 12 months. I think for a personal care brand that we're talking to, it is very much about the next 12 months because we think it's important to be on shelves. So I think that's important. I think which marketplace you choose, again, is important. So, um, you know, I've been having this debate with my wife. She runs a fashion brand in India. And given that I'm working with a lot of brands, taking them global, her answer is that, why don't you help me? And she runs a high-end fashion brand, which makes, like, for example, printed scarves, hand embroidered dupattas, hair, pashmina shawls. And I keep on telling her, you know, that I can only think of one marketplace that you'll do really well in, and that's Etsy, right? Mm. And um, I don't know if your product and your brand story will really resonate, for example, on an Amazon. So it's very important to be able to, and that's changing. I know, like, if you put on your telly these days, you'll see Amazon fashion. And uh, I think there's one of the Indian actresses who's now their brand ambassador as well. So they're obviously trying to create an image with fashion as well, but it still tends to be very Western where not really ethnic, Indian ethnic, the way my wife does it. So I think it is important because I know that if I take that brand on Amazon, I'm probably diluting her brand identity for the next platform that she wants to launch in, right? So for example, Etsy is the right platform for her and I'm working to try and figure out how I get that brand on Etsy. So it, it and that that's an important decision because it's very easy that Amazon is the biggest brand. Let me just launch it on Amazon because that's what makes sense. Yeah, interesting. Um, I also want to double down on pricing, which is when it comes to pricing, it, it can't, I'm assuming it can't be cost plus, which is, you know, this much to make, this much to ship, this much to take it to US and therefore I sell it at that. Because there is, is there a perception of low price products in Western countries being automatically assumed that they are not good quality and hence the price needs to be somewhere close. We, we we discussed that the cost is 10x, you know, and 10x lower and hence you can, you have more room to price it. But what's your experience when in pricing these products and, and yeah, is it just cheapest wins? Yeah, I honestly think um, that, you know, um, that price arbitrage really isn't there that much. I think with most, for example, if you go to an amazon.com, there are sellers from all over the world who are selling there. So I think somewhere or the other, the, the price has settled to what is a viable price for international sellers with a price arbitrage. And then, yes, you have a brand, then the price is in your control. If you're selling a brand, it doesn't matter in which category. If it's a known brand, then the pricing is in your control. So what we found is it's not definitely not a cost plus thing. So that I can tell you, uh, that's, that's absolutely the wrong approach. So we actually start with a competitive analysis of what similar products are selling for, and then, you know, figure out what, a pro what product should be priced at. For example, if a product is a plain vanilla product, it is basically commoditized to an extent and it's just competing with the other products that are there on the platform then price is a very important factor in how do we get the initial demand built up but if it is not just a commoditized product if there is for example uh, if there are variations or if there are nuances about the product that make it uh, very relevant for that audience we will very much look at competitive pricing we will even price at a premium because yes 
pricing tends to play, especially for a brand that is not known out there, pricing tends to define the perception of the brand as whether it's a premium brand or it's a, a discount brand. And cost plus tends to be the third element of our pricing is that we'll do cost plus and make sure we can make money doing it. Because if not, then it doesn't really make sense, right? You don't want to open a channel for the for vanity. Yeah. Uh, Akshay, you've now built, you know, taken so many brands global and you have a lot of experiences. If you could highlight two extreme examples of, you know, something that just bombed, that just didn't work, um, be it product quality, you know, marketing, branding, whatever it may be, um, and your perspective on why it bombed and something that's been a runaway success, right? Uh, with whatever numbers you can use, with yeah. whatever, you know, to create that. Because I, what I really want to do is show the possibilities um, in terms of the upside of what's, what, what, what can be done. Absolutely. And I think, okay, so let me first start with uh, the one that bombed because uh, I, it was a first-hand experience for me, which is the brand I told you that we tried to create called Miraki, right? And uh, again, it why did it bomb? It didn't, the product was great. I, the, this, I actually spent three months in product development and this is a personal story, which is why I can talk about it in a lot of detail and share all the numbers you want. Because uh, it's, it's all about, it's one of, I, I, it is my failure, but it's, it's probably the experience that taught me the most. The Miraki brand is still present in a lot of presentations that Shiprocket does in terms of website, because I used the full power in terms of everything that I had learned in this business for the last three, four years to be able to create a brand, you know, even the, I used to run marketing for Shiprocket till a few months ago. So even the brand name around Miraki, which meant, you know, it's a moment of surprise. It's a Greek word, which says a delightful surprise, something that's unexpected. So we, you know, I spent a lot, I did, there was a lot of science behind what we did. We sourced products from some of the best artisans across India. And I think the reason that bombed is again, I, it was not done on the basis of data. It was done on the basis of passion, on personal notion, on opinion. And I think that is the, the one thing that I learned is you need to know what is selling and you need to be able to compete with that. Just because we thought it was a beautiful product, had a great offline response in India. We even took, you know, these products and discussed it during HC events in India, etc. And people loved it. It was a beautiful product, but it just was not something that there was that bigger demand for, or at least at that point in the US, right? If someone wanted to buy these products, they were most likely going to go offline to an urban outfitters, to an anthropology type of a store, they were not necessarily going to come on a marketplace to search for it, right? And especially the delivery timelines, if you're not going to be able to meet four to five days, people didn't want it because a doorknob, a tapestry, these are impulse purchases. You like it, you want it, you buy it, right? Do you really want to wait 15 to 20 days for it? Probably not. So I think that was the biggest lesson for me is that whatever we do now, we want it to be very strongly based in data. Most entrepreneurs we meet are very, very passionate, right? They've built a brand because of that passion. It's a tough job, but it's important to be that voice of reason with logic, telling them, you know, just because you like this product doesn't necessarily mean that particular product should be your first product that goes global. Like I told you, like I speaking about an entrepreneur on the fashion, kids fashion brand. And he was shocked. He's like, I cannot imagine that you're selling this product. I was like, yes. I and I'm actually, I'm, I'm assuming it's not an easy job to convince that entrepreneur that this might not work, right? Because as you said, they're very passionate about it. And, and an immediate response could be, I've done this for five years. You don't know anything about my business. You don't know anything about my brand. How do you know this is going to work or not work? Is that a fair pushback that you that you sense? I'm mean, if not verbally, but uh, no, absolutely, you, know. you do. I mean, you get it verbally. You get it in much stronger words than that, right? People say we know this is our brand. It's our call. We know what we're doing. And even with this entrepreneur, for example, we launched a category that they wanted. And I'll talk to you very specifically. It was kids' pajama sets, right? And one of the one of our feedback was that you know sizing is very different in India, Indian kids and. US American kids, right? So don't go with something, go with something that is less of a sizing issue, either free size or for example, the category that we had pitched to him was dresses. And so we launched both. So the good part is the entrepreneur said, no, this I'm telling you this will work. Since you are telling me, we will launch this category around dresses as well. And today we're pretty much only doing dresses, right? The pajama sets haven't worked, right? Again, competition, very different price points, very challenging. And in India, that's his best selling category. So it's fine. Uh, so yes, you do face a lot of that. And, uh, I think most entrepreneurs we meet do tend to give us that, that year and hear us out. And the ones who don't usually, they don't even get to that level we're talking, right? Because they have very fixed opinions. And 
the last thing we want is for someone to invest even let's say ten thousand dollars because the investment is not on marketing it's not on anything it's about the inventory that you block right uh, and then say that you know we failed we want this to be a success and then you you experiment to take bigger bigger risks we want the first phase to be a hopefully a low risk high reward type of an outcome for every entrepreneur we work with and then going back to the one which you said you know was a runaway success was this costume jewelry brand i'm sorry under India, I cannot really take the example because in a pilot, I'm hoping I get to go do this long term also with the brand. Uh, but again, very open, right? Like there were joint meetings with the entrepreneur every time discussing to every PDP on for every product, the PDP being a product detail page on a platform, how many views they were getting, what was happening, why the conversion was high, low on every PDP. That is the level of discussion we used to have. And I can tell you it was a runaway success because the entrepreneur pretty much ran the pilot. And the mm -hmm. entrepreneur, basically, he listened to everything that we had to say and said, yes, no, yes, no. And that it was such logical thinking that you really couldn't argue with anything, right? And anything that we wanted or we suggested happened in 24 hours. So like that photo shoot that I'm telling you with the Western wear, from discussion, agreement, it was 24 hours and we had uploaded it live on the platform in 24 hours. You know, that kind of responsiveness, commitment, I think it's, it's incredible. Because had it been five, six days, it would have been five, six days of more of advertising money being spent or us pausing the advertising budget to try and figure out what's happening, what's not happening. So I think uh, that for us has been, it's been a huge success. And yeah. to the point where now we want to actually forward deploy those goods into the US and not just drop ship out of India and actually commit to two to three day delivery anywhere in the US. Fantastic. It's almost like if a brand has to go, you know, anywhere outside India, you have to bring it bring your thinking bare back, bring your thinking back to ground zero on how you're going to build this right anything that you've learned in india is good but you can't take that as an assumption to actually go out and you know apply those assumptions and try and build something there um intuition is probably developed in india but you really have to start from scratch in you know thinking of how do you sell the product what price points what kind of products and all of that very interesting um how good or bad is the compliance situation right because when we talk about exports, age old, it's such a complicated industry, not just from a perspective of, you know, taking the products there and selling it there, but just the fact that you have to, you know, export it out of India, import it in another country. Have the compliance laws over the last few years changed? If not, are there better ways of solving them? Are there, is there more clarity? What's happening in the world of compliance when you try to sell off outside? No, absolutely. And I, it's still a challenge. Very honestly, I said it is, it is one of the most complex things about selling overseas is the, is the compliance. I think um, a lot of it has been streamlined. So um, at least from 10 years ago, I think there's been a huge improvement. I still think that it's a lot of duplication of effort that you have to do across multiple portals. But I think what's happened, the good thing that's happened is at least for SMEs or entrepreneurs, brands, the type that we deal with at ShipRocket, this used to be a huge barrier to entry. And a lot of enablers have come in who have built tech processes, which take care of a lot of the compliance burden, right? And it's not even ShipRocket, right? We'll take care of the compliance burden when it comes to shipping. But when it comes to, for example, receiving payments for orders that are sold overseas, that is the biggest compliance, right? You have for every order or every payment you receive from a marketplace, you have to have an FIRC filing to the RBI, which says I exported this good and against that I have received this money. Now you go to an Indian entrepreneur who's selling online, they now finally understand GST and now you tell them now you'll have to do this RBI compliance. The word RBI only makes most people, you know, you, they, their shoulders droop by two inches the moment you mention this because it, it's, a, it's a huge phobia in the minds of many, many entrepreneurs, especially growing up in the country. Okay? We don't want this, you know, this whole foreign reserves issue to be there in our business. But there are a lot of enablers who build tech enabled solutions, who will do all the compliance for you, who will do all the recon for you. And we always recommend and we do the same thing. We pay these enablers for these services that you please do it. Everything reconciled, you get a file, you give to your CA and your CA will do your filing for you. It's it's become as simple as that. So while the back end and the processes in between still tend to be very complex, I think the government has at least, has moved a very long way in making everything online, which I think has made these enable has enabled these enablers, so so to speak of, to actually exist today. And I but I think for an entrepreneur or a brand or an SME, however you want to call it, the end result is that it is not it is not a barrier to entry anymore. It is just a question of certain percentage of your margin going away to pay for these services. And we personally recommend... 
sorry ba- there's barrier in terms of courage as well right like in terms of just being able to enter knowing that there is going to be compliance and i will need to figure it out and i will make mistakes along the way and we will just figure it out i have a very personal experience with firc the fact that you mentioned this um i sub- i export software um and for the longest time and Sh- shopify is a platform that we export software on um and we were getting money in inr uh we should have been getting it in usd so that we could get the firc and then we are not liable to pay gst but i ended up paying gst because i was getting the money in inr painful lesson to learn because i had to pay extra money but now i know better right um and it's that it's that point of it's not that complicated once you understand it but once somebody throws that term foreign inward inward remittance certificate you're like are you sure i want to do this uh right so it's it, there's some courage involved in terms of actually you know taking that plunge and making sure you're able to um just go through that phase of understanding what the compliance are and actually you know figuring out systems that can that can match those uh compliance needs yeah and you know what said honestly i think it's 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 a lot of the historic almost phobia that we have from many years ago when it was that complex right today gst is not as it isn't simple either but because yeah. it's a necessity for us to do business in india we've all come to terms with it and we've learned how to do it and now it's just become a normal part of our life right yeah. sales tax for example used to be a huge issue it was far more complex but it was something that people were used to then you if you have to do business you need to have it Correct. right and i think it's the, as we think about global selling i think because there's transparency while it is complex but because there is i think transparency is the biggest uh, the biggest thing that's changed in the last 5 years right asymmetry of information is what causes fear the moment mm-hmm. the asymmetry of information is not there there's transparency it doesn't matter how complex it is there'll be ways to solve the complexity as long as you know what you're doing and you know what the end outcome is and i think yeah. that's really what's changed in the last 2 3 years i i 100% agree uh, one of the things that i wanted to mention based on what you said the phobia it's almost like younger entrepreneurs with no baggage are probably going to be able to take brands uh outside versus experienced people who have the product who probably have the manufacturing capacity but still have that phobia of you know export is going to be very complicated why go there um so in an ideal world i would think it's a family business with a newer generation coming in has the manufacturing capacity has you know the product understanding and the new generation sort of has the courage to take it global or a completely new new person entering a market building a brand with contract manufacturers and taking it global is that your experience is how's your experience it's near on the head it's absolutely the two segments right and the best segment for us is that fearless entrepreneur the person who has no baggage right at the end yeah. of the day doesn't even have a mom or dad saying oh you know i've tried to do this before it doesn't work Yeah. and it's it's the something i envy the most about you know a lot of the young entrepreneurs i meet today i'm a i'm a bit older now with the gray hair but it's the fearlessness that they have right saying why can't we do it right yeah. and uh, and that's it's it's literally the right attitude i think uh, because also you're you're willing that you're willing to go into the unknown but those two segments are exactly the two segments that we're talking about in terms of pretty much my entire pipeline of brands that i'm going to take global <laughs> it's the the new generation in a traditional business or it's a first time entrepreneur a very interesting we're going to switch gears a little bit akshay uh, because i i i mean we we discussed this right we are still very early in this journey of you know the foundation is being laid out there's going to be more people who are going to be able to ride on the work that all of you guys are doing right now um let's let's make some prediction of 5 10 years whatever you think is the right horizon but what categories do you think win win out of india apart from the ones that you've already mentioned what do you think which are the most you know potential high potential categories when it take up when it when it comes to taking brands building brands global so i think so let me just give you a first principle first and then i'll answer your question specifically as well i think the brands which have a unique uh product differentiation or a uh, or a competitive advantage in terms of price are uh, any products right not a brand any product that is either differentiated strongly enough or is much more cheaper to manufacture or produce in india are the two types of products or uh, two categories of products that will do well when it comes to global marketplaces right so for example personal care is something that i am personally very bullish about because i do think that with you know ayurvedic products with niche products around it could be shampoos face washes organic you know uh, no artificial ingredients no chemicals this is something that's been a part of what we've been selling in our country for many many years the trend around sustainability natural organic globally is a trend that started about 5 to 7 years ago but it's part of what's been part of our history for about 30 years so i think those are the types of products in personal care for example that will do very well i think when i talk about product differentiation is also around for example like we spoke about jewelry something that we have a unique competitive advantage in manufacturing in india as well because not everything is machine made a lot of times things are handmade and i think handmade as a product differentiation is very very strong 
and i think um, in terms of drilling this down into two into categories of products i think personal care products the you know fashion jewelry fashion by itself fashion for example is something that i think it's important but it's going to be certain categories within fashion categories which do not necessarily have a lot of sizing issues categories which resonate with the indian diaspora and that's something that we in fashion we speak to a lot of entrepreneurs we tend to focus more on indian ethnic indian ethnic we're talking about kurtis which kind of kind of blend into that middle ground between western wear and indian ethnic or pure indian ethnic like sarees because they you're catering to an indian to an older indian diaspora in one case you're probably catering to a younger indian diaspora and again we we identify markets with brands along that i think one or one or two categories where we are initially seeing challenges for example is consumer electronics because mm. we see price the price competitiveness vis-a-vis for example products from china is just not there and it's very hard we found to be able to find that product differentiation so it's something that we consciously for now at least are staying away from right mm. as and when if we find those unique products uh, that we do believe can sell we will target those categories bigger and bigger but i think because it's a large play there is on price it's not really on quality premium or you know product differentiation we find it a bit of a challenge there whereas in indian e-commerce that's a huge category by itself but again consumer uh, when we talk about electronics accessories stuff like phone covers printed phone covers customized phone covers huge market why because we have a cost advantage to doing it in india china has an even bigger cost advantage but then the kind of designs etc that some entrepreneurs are able to create tend to you know you're able to sell something that costs you probably a dollar to make for 15 dollars so it's going to and it's a lightweight product it'll pay for the shipping everything by itself so within so i would not so when i say consumer electronics i'm talking about more mass market speakers headphones that kind of stuff but when it comes to accessories for example cell phone covers we find a huge market there so it is very very nuanced right you have to yeah. go across there so we try to approach it from a first principle perspective either the product differentiation is there or the price advantage is there yeah and if you have if you have either of those and in, in you know in some cases both of those then you'll have to cre- you'll create categories that we can't even think of today right um, i'm seeing i'm seeing potential in toys that's an industry that i've been you yes. know uh, reading about and and learning more about for the last 2 3 years and there's some very interesting companies being you know being built in india very smart toys the the blend of you know uh, using using your phone and a physical toy companies doing that companies doing purely educational toys i think those are doing really well as well um so there there's going to be i think it'll mat- it'll depend on you know the the generation of entrepreneurs that come in for the next 3 4 years and you know people who lead some of these categories and build a market outside because most markets exist it's it's a matter of can you build an indian product can you take an indian product uh, to these markets no absolutely and you're right absolutely uh, toys is an important category it's something we haven't really focused on ourselves right now but i just invested in a startup which is doing exactly this they're taking more interactive toys and their primary their market now is looking outside the us uh, outside india right because they do believe there's a huge market out there and you'd be surprised you know even there's a there's a huge company in india doing wooden toys yeah and they're doing very well on marketplaces and they started doing this well before we were even thinking of it yeah. and i'm talking about overseas marketplaces so uh, absolutely like i said the niches are there are amazing products and amazing businesses that can be built even for people who have not traditionally had a business in india i think it's even if you try to build a business just looking at one market overseas i think today you can do it it's feasible to do it sitting in india without saying that at first i have to build a business in india and then i will export yeah that was going to be my next question do you do you predict that there are going to be brands primarily built for the us and if it happens to sell in india well and good but you have answered that question um well, i want to switch gears one last time we've established the fact that there is a huge opportunity of indian brands going global some of it we already know some of it will probably evolve over the next few years and in terms of the ecosystem that's required to actually support these brands some of the work some of the things that you've already spoken about agencies that help with listing but where do you think you know given your experience on the ground where are the white spaces for people to build new businesses right and this doesn't have to be anything innovative and ground breaking but good service businesses good agencies good you know businesses that support this ecosystem can actually um help these people go go global what are what are some of these businesses where's the opportunity there no absolutely and i think the one thing that you know is very clearly stands out in my mind right now is around branding around content you know a lot of what so and 
this could be a freelancer or you can build businesses around doing this, right? A lot of the content marketing that we do, a lot of the brand marketing that we do today, and a lot of the skill sets that are there present, for example, for me to look at in the Indian market, tend to focus a lot on Indian consumers, Indian sensibilities, right? Con even the way a content is written, even like a tagline, when you're trying to do a marketing campaign, it's completely different to what you will say in India versus what you will probably say in the US for that particular product. And I think there it's, for me, it's it's a huge white space right now. I think that talent is just not there. Right? And I'm having to pay uh, content writers in dollars sitting in the US to be able to do this work for me. And yes, what we're doing is we're working with uh, content writers here because it's not just that the skill set, is, it's not about talent, it's actually about skill set. It's about understanding that market, right? If you've never really been a consumer in that market, it's, it's tough to understand that. So we're actually working with a lot of freelance content writers now to help create this content, right? And kind of almost going into a mentorship model long term where we have senior, we have senior people from the US, for example, doing workshops with our content team here and hopefully getting them to that level. But I think a lot of businesses around influencers, around content, around brand can be built because that's what's the most in terms of ROI or return on investment on your marketing dollars, it's what's going to help you build a brand long term. You can run an ad on Facebook, but it'll only get conversion if it actually resonates with the person there, right? So uh, even the way a marketplace ads work in, if work in India, for if you get um, ads from Amazon, Snapdeal, any of these market Flipkart on uh, Facebook versus ads that you'll see from marketplaces on your feed when you're there, completely different. So I think that's it's important. That's a huge white space to be able to understand. I think there is a white space around, um, and this is more from a, I think you will need to have operations outside India from a warehousing returns, that perspective. I think a lot of the businesses that have been built in overseas countries as well are very fragmented, very traditional, non-tech enabled, catering to more of the freight business that used to happen B2B bulk out of India 10 years ago. The B2C, uh, you know, warehousing, e-commerce enabled warehousing returns it, it still has a long way to go, even in developed markets like the US. So I think that more from a US perspective, I think there's a huge opportunity there. In fact, my I'm traveling to the US in a few weeks and most of my meetings are with Indian entrepreneurs who are there, who are in freight, saying, how do we how do we kind of redefine our model to, work, to be able to work with ShipRocket? So what is it that you guys need? And it's really heartening because these are people who know far more than I know about supply chain, been doing it for 30 years, saying, you know what, we want to reinvent because we do believe there's a huge scope for this business going forward. And we do believe there's value add that we have. We're not just a warehousing space where we take a bulk shipment in and ship out a bulk shipment. Now we're going to take a bulk shipment, we're going to break it down into smaller pieces, store it as and when orders come, package it, and then ship it out. So, you know, we believe because of our value addition, there's more money we can make. So I think um, lots of opportunities in this entire area. Very exciting, Akshay. One last question to close it out. Let's say I'm an entrepreneur with a product in India, which has some you know differentiated product that I think can go global. What are some of the steps that I need to do um, in order to be able to run this experiment? Of course, you know, get in touch with Shiprocket X. That's going to be one part of it. But even from a team perspective, my mindset perspective, how do, how should I look at the next? You know, what should the time frame be? For running this experiment, what kind of team members, what kind of resources do I set aside, both in terms of people and money? Um, if you can help us with that, I think that'll be uh, very engaging for our listeners. Oh, absolutely. And I think, um, yes, ShipRocket X is one of those platforms. But by the way, there are plenty of platforms out there who can help, which can help you today. So while I will obviously plug my, my own company, there are plenty of solutions. So uh, it's not just us. We're not the only game in town. I think that the investment need is actually not that high. So if you're an entrepreneur, you have a product or a suite of products which you think can go global. I think the answer very simply is first, all you need within your own team for the first phase and for long term is having one SPOC almost was design designated to this pilot, this experiment, whatever you want to call it. Because if you don't do that, honestly, you're going to delay things out so long that you'll probably never get to a definitive answer. And I think that's all you need because that person can then work with all the enablers out there to be able to do a low cost pilot. So I think the only cost you'll have is in terms of the inventory that you need to block, the opportunity cost around it. So if you want to block anywhere from a thousand to 10,000 units, I would say minimum block at least a hundred pieces per unit. So if you were say a thousand, then just make 10 products that you want to, or SKUs that you want to take global and limit it to that. If you want to block 10,000, then you can do it with a hundred products, right? And keep and start with a dropship model. So there are low barriers to entry. Uh, so the cost will be around blocking your inventory and not being able to sell it 
uh, for the next, let's say it's six months is what I always tell entrepreneurs, give it time. Sometimes it can take you as long as three months just to go live. And it all depends on the responsiveness from the entrepreneur. It depends on whether the product needs FDA approval or any local approval to be able to sold there, to be able to, uh, to sell this in a foreign country. So it can be as less as 15 days. It can be as long as three months, depending on all these complications. But then give it at least three months beyond that to be able to see results of this coming out. So usually, you know, it's a ballpark figure. It all depends on the category of product. But we usually tell entrepreneurs, take in mind that you want to be able to devote $10,000 into this pilot, into this experiment and uh, block your inventory. And that's it. And you probably, and so far, I don't think we've ended up spending $10,000 with any brand that we worked with, but we, this is just what we tell them. It is also a gauge of, gauge. it helps us gauge the seriousness of the entrepreneur, right? Because the inter, an entrepreneur says, I want to spend $100 into it. Probably the level of commitment is just not there. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Akshay. Uh, very exciting work. And uh, the way you've gone about, you know, building your own brand first and then understanding the challenges and then trying to solve them. Uh, that's very inspiring as well. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I'm 100% sure the foundation that you and, you know, the rest of the people in this industry are laying down is going to result in, a, you know, thousands of brands actually going global because of all the work that's been done, that's being done today. Um, so thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Sid. It's always a pleasure talking to you.